assumptions starting out, right? We're assuming that we've already done our excavation, put in our underlayment fabric, we've compacted our base material up, set final grade on that, right? And now what we're doing is we're gonna go ahead and take our screed pipes, and if you can see here on the ground, we have our two pipes laid out. Now, I wanna point out that what we've done here is we've used two different diameter pipes. Because we are building next to this bar, and this bar uh, signifies either a hardscape feature or a home foundation, right? It doesn't matter what it is. We want to make sure that we're pushing water away from that structure. So when we start laying this out, we're going to start back in this corner. The laying process will start back in this corner, and then we're going to go ahead and lay the pattern out in a diagonal fashion as we come out from there. But I just want to show you guys, you know, we're gonna also go ahead and build a freestanding wall down on this low end. And I just wanna point out that when you're doing a paver patio, the last thing you wanna do is push water towards a freestanding wall or some sort of other hardscape feature that you're working with, right? So you wanna make sure that water's not gonna be trapped behind your freestanding wall. Now, we mentioned the laser transit. This is a self-leveling unit, Bosch makes, oh, seven or 800 bucks, something like that. I bring these out on the job sites and you can see I'm getting, uh, I'm getting lasered right now, snipers on me. This thing's gonna start to spin. If you're not familiar with the laser transit, it gives you about a 300 foot radius all the way around. I hope I set this high enough so I'm not blinding anyone. Um, but if you look here, you'll see that as that laser comes over towards me, I've got this reader, right? I've got this reader and I've got a measuring stick. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show the height difference between these pipes. So as I'm setting up my screed pipes, I'm checking it with my laser transit. Oop, I'm loosening the wrong thing. Right, so we've got the self-leveling transit set up. I'm gonna go ahead and dial this in. You start to hear some beeps. There we go. Now, if you look at the front of this, there's gonna be an arrow that points up and an arrow that points down and a little light next to each arrow. That just tells you which direction you need to go ahead and adjust your laser transit. This one is set very, very close. So what we're gonna see here is it's real hard to get it to dial in and stay on green. But once we go back and forth between up and down, you know that you're right in the neighborhood that you need to be in. There's the green light. Now, if I come over here, you're gonna see that putting it on this pipe is now too low, right? So what I have to do is I have to lift this up about a half inch to get back on that green light. That tells me that this pipe is a half inch lower than that pipe. That means I'm gonna have good slope away from my structure as I'm screening sand out. You can also use a zip line level. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, Chris, if you wanna just kinda quickly show how that works. Thank you. What we have here is, is the, uh, the base unit, the brain of the whole thing, right, is sitting over here. There's a liquid in this tube and uh, it levels with wherever this unit is sitting, okay? So what we're getting right now is a reading on the floor, on the concrete floor. So he's gonna set this zip line apparatus right onto our pipe. So you gotta set your zero kind of like he did. Uh, you just put it right down there, there's a zero button. You have to repeat that what he says. So what he's saying is that you have to zero this zip line level out, right? Whatever threshold you're trying to set it up to, you're gonna hit the zero out button. And he used our tallest pipe, our one inch pipe, to do that. So he zeroed us out at our highest point. Now we're gonna come over here, and as he sets this on here, on our low pipe, we're gonna start to see that we get a negative reading. Negative 0.5 inches is what we should see on there. And I know it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but trust me, that's what this thing says. Uh, it's telling us that we have a half inch deviation between our pipes, and that's what we want. We wanna have about a half inch. We've got about eight feet here that we're gonna be screening out. Rather have a little extra slope there. So we're gonna set it up according to that. We do. Yes, we do. All right, so if you want your own zip line level, see the guys at the Versalot contractor desk, about 900 bucks, and it can be yours, okay? Um, so with these assumptions made, we know that our pipes are set up properly, right, we, for slope. We've got our uh, one in 10. 
uh, slope set up here, so we're going to be running water away from our grill area, okay? So now we'll go ahead and start breaking open some of these bags of sand. If you were on a job site, you'd probably call, uh, call Sven or Oli over with the bobcat and have them start dumping sand onto your patio base, right? In this case, we've got bags. We don't have a machine, so we're going to bring in some these small bags and go ahead and just dump them out. <clears throat> How many of you guys have done paver installs? I'm familiar with all this. All right, so we got a lot of guys that are, that uh, this is going to be a little repetition for you, but maybe we can give you a couple of tips that will help speed things up, right, through this process. So what we've got set up here are two pipes. They're about, they're about four and a half or five feet apart. That means I can use a six-foot screed bar to go ahead and screen back. I can have it overlap on either side and almost get all eight feet screened out with one pipe or one uh, screed rail. All right. Now, in a situation like this, you want to start laying in the corner. You want to start your paver pattern back here in the corner, right? So in order to do that, as we screen sand back, one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to have to put some sort of a platform over our bedding sand to step on to protect our sand, or we're going to walk right over our sand. Well, another thing that we started doing is partial screens, right? So you'll screen back the first three or four feet, pull your pipes down, fill your ruts, and then you can actually lay in a platform to lay off of. Kind of like when you're doing a circle. You saw that guy standing out there on his own island. The same thing is true when you're doing a uh, 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 an install where you're stuck back in a corner. You don't want to paint yourself into that corner by screening too much sand back. Let's try to puddle for Chris a little bit here. By the way, this is going to be one of the best paver uh, demonstrations we've ever done. We've got both of the Dubois brothers here working with us. These guys are uh, perfectionists, so we're going to get this thing dialed in just right. We need a little more sand on our outside edge here. We want to make sure that we get our sand all the way out to the edge here to fill up the edge as best we can. Um, once we start laying the pavers in, you'll see that we have a little bit of slough left on the edge. And again, that's the stuff that you'd go back with a trowel and pull it back before you're going to install your edge restraint. There we go. So you can see again, puddling, right? And Chris, you might as well see if you can get that thing to kind of go a little farther over there to the right just so we get out close to the edge there. There we go. Perfect. So even though we've got a seven and a half or an eight foot stretch here that we're trying to screen out, we can use a six foot screed bar or a magnesium screed here in this case, which by the way, we're going to be doing a couple giveaways. We're going to be doing a giveaway after lunch and then we're also going to be doing a giveaway at the end of the day. We're going to give away, I think, two six foot screeds and two eight foot screeds. These things aren't cheap. They're fantastic tools. They are not pry bars, right? Don't leave them laying around on the ground. I've driven over a couple of these with the bobcat. You're never going to bend it back. <laughs> Once it's bent, it's bent. So make sure that you're taking good care of these things. Uh, you know, wrap them in bubble tape or whatever you got to do to keep it safe. So we're just kind of cleaning up some of the edges here. Why don't we go ahead and pull our pipes back just a couple of feet and then we can start filling in those ruts and start to lay in our pattern a little bit. Now we're going to be using the Willow Creek Slate Stone. How many guys have used Slate Stone? It's an awesome paver, right? At a good price. It comes with the new infusion technology where the sealer is actually built into the paver. It goes all the way through the paver. Lasts a really long time. Maintains color. It's also going to battle the UV, uh, UV rays and acid rain, stuff that's going to start to make the pavers kind of degrade a little bit or uh, fade a little bit. And the sealer, again, is a great sales tool. Right in the, yeah. <laughs> Sunny side up, buddy. All right, so as we pull this back just a little bit more, We'll see here that we end up with, you know, a screened area, 
of the patio. We'll pull this pipe back just a touch more and then we're gonna start filling this rut in. But what I wanna do here before we pull this back any farther is actually start to lay in this corner. So what we'll do, you got your trowel there, let me just fix this up. We're gonna trowel this sand out nice and smooth here. How many of you guys use a trowel this size on your job site? This size, really? This is a little short, right? You're gonna get better uniformity from a longer trowel. I usually try to get at least a 24 inch long trowel and it's just so that it floats over the sand a little bit easier. But you can see once you've troweled it out, it makes it nice and smooth. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to rough lay in our sailor course and then we'll check it with our square. Actually, before we do that, why don't we lay the square out? I just wanna point out that whenever you're meeting up with a patio, you may be meeting up with an irregular with an irregular surface, an irregular vertical surface, right? In this case, it's a ledge stone bar. This is their uh, ledge stone bar kit. So as we set this square out, first thing we're gonna do is check and see whether or not we're actually square, right? These guys did a pretty good job. This thing is darn close to perfect. Now what I'm gonna do with this square is I'm just gonna take it and space it off of the ledge stone here a little bit. The reason I'm doing this is twofold. One, I wanna make sure that I'm laying my paver pattern in a perfect square uh, 90 degree angle. I wanna make sure that it's not off, right? So I'm gonna use this square as a guide as I start setting in my sailor course. I'm gonna step right on this pipe for right now. We're gonna go ahead and start laying in or setting our first pavers. Now, one thing I wanna point out is that we've got this grill here. The door is set a little bit low, right? So the door is actually pushing out into our pattern by about a half an inch. You probably wouldn't wanna cut just a little tiny section off of your pavers, so you may just space your pattern off of the bar by about a half an inch. So that's what we're gonna go ahead and do here. Go ahead and set a few more of these in. Now this square that we've got laid in here and we're using as a guide, this could also be a string line. Maybe you've got uh, uh, a chalk line that you snap your straight edge with. Whatever method you're using to make sure that your paver edge is nice and clean and straight. There we go, cool. Fantastic, all right, I'll lay in just a couple more of these and then we can go ahead and start with the body of our patio. Now, I'm stepping on some of this sand just to get in here. And you see what I mean when I say you can paint yourself into a corner really easily doing these installs if you're not careful about where you're stepping and when you're stopping, you know? Hand me just a couple more of those. All right, so we've got a good portion of our sailor course already laid out here. At this point, I'm feeling really good about the fact that we're laying we're laying on something square. We've got a perfect square here. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove this. There you are, sir. Get the protractor out of there. And then um, right now what I'll do is I'm gonna start actually laying in part of, the, part of the pattern, part of the body. I don't wanna have to walk through. Let's start with a large guy here. I don't wanna have to walk through my bedding sand. So I'm gonna go ahead and start in the corner here. Now I should mention as well that slate stone has a predetermined pattern, right? As you look at our brochures and our catalogs, you see that the slate stone is laid in a particular pattern that's repeatable. It does create a few cuts around the edges. So for the sake of demonstration, we're gonna use a running bond pattern. So Jim just pointed out that the way that these are palletized, you end up with one big paver 
to every two smaller pavers. So there's two squares, two small ones, we call them Twinkies, um, you know, but it's the smallest paver in the pattern. If you're doing a running bond, you have to make sure that you respect the way that this stuff is palletized because Chris and Joe are only gonna take returns by the layer. You can't return by the piece with slate stone. So you wanna make sure that as you're pulling off, you're trying to pull off layer by layer. You're also trying to pull off multiple pallets so that you get a good color mix. So you can see what they've done here, is we've gotten one large paver, a square, a Twinkie, we'll do a square and then another Twinkie, right? And that's basically one set when we're doing our running bond pattern with these pavers. Get a large guy here. So now at this point, I've stepped out onto the patio. I'm gonna lay this big guy in and then let's go ahead and set up just one more row so they don't feel like I'm on the edge of a cliff. I'm gonna take this trowel here and we'll pull back our pipe just a touch so we know we got some space. And I'm gonna go ahead and fix, you know, if I had to step on anything, right, I'm gonna go ahead and fix my sand up a little bit, get it back to nice and uniform. Now, let's use a square first. <laughs> yeah, they're usually wearing those, uh, those electric shock collars. I don't know why they're not wearing those today. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and go two squares in a row here because we're gonna try to do a repeatable pattern here where we actually have kind of a mystique paver pattern. When you're looking at it from one angle, you don't necessarily see the pattern emerge, but then when you're looking at it from horizontally, you start to see the pattern come out. We need a little guy. Here it is. And then we'll use another square. I know we broke a couple of those yesterday when we were making steps. We, we split them on purpose. Another little guy. Yeah, that's a good point, Jimmy. So one thing you'll notice about when I'm setting these pavers down, I'm using the old click and drop method, right? So as I'm setting this thing in, I'm pushing these pavers up against the pavers that are already laid, right? It's called the click and drop. It's just a good way to make sure that you're gonna lay a nice square uniform pattern with these things. And I think we actually wanna run out maybe just a little, little bit farther here. Maybe we'll stop right there. That seems like a real good place because we're gonna have a nice even break there, so we'll run our sailor course back from there. So we'll need another square. So now, we're gonna keep screening our sand back. Thank you, Chris. If you just wanna dump that stuff out, we just need to get this pipe pulled back far enough so that we can start our next row now. Do you guys ever do anything like this where you do a partial screen? How many of you guys have used this kind of method, right? It makes a lot of sense when you're doing some patios. You don't use it every time. Sometimes if you're doing just a big square patio, you're gonna just screen the whole thing out, right? Because you have easy access to your starting point. It doesn't become an issue where you have to worry about getting painted into a corner. All right, here we go. So we're gonna puddle this stuff up. Chris is just screening back here. There we go. And so what I'm doing here is as I see him screen back, I'm watching for any points where maybe his fingers stick in a little bit too deep or maybe there's a, you know, a situation like this where we had pulled the pipe back but not quite fixed it in place quite yet and it leaves a divot. One thing I'm sure you all already understand is that it only makes sense that whatever we're doing here with our sand is really gonna manifest on the top of our pavers or our paver surface. So take time to make sure that you're getting your sand installation done nice and smooth, make sure everything is perfect, right? 
Now as he's pulling back, we'll throw a handful or two in here. Is that our last bag of sand? Okay, cool. No problemo. We'll just screen back as far as we can and then we'll lay out to it. So what we're going to do is as we lay our patio in, as we get down to our finishing point here, we're going to build another ledge stone seat wall down here with a pillar. Okay? And that's again why we want to make sure that we're running our slope this way. So it's not coming back at any of the features that we have uh, built here or at a feature that we're about to build. Okay? So why don't we just go ahead and see if we can get this into some sort of even line and then we'll pull our pipes. There you go. That's fine. So you can see as he's pulling this back, he's kind of self-puddling, right? If he gets a low spot where the sand's not coming all the way up to the top, he's just going to take his, uh, his hand scoop, right? Take some sand, dump it in that low spot, and then we'll trowel it out as we work our way through. Yeah, there we go. Cool. All right, perfect. Now we'll pull our pipes out. There we go. Take some of this sand from the edge here, the slough sand, start filling these ruts in a little bit. I'll let you guys do that and I'm gonna start laying pavers again. So uh, that's, that's one thing. If you're an owner, owner, operator, installer, marketer, salesperson, like a lot of us are in this industry, um, always be thinking about what you guys can be doing while you're doing something else, right? So I would have maybe one guy keep screening sand while another guy's gonna keep handing me pavers here. Let's start out with the little guy here. The Twinkie. And again, we're doing the old ICPI click and drop here. Perfect. Yep. One more little guy. And then we need a big one. And let me just stop here for a minute. I don't know if the camera can zoom in on this or not, but this is the paver Joe just handed me. This paver looks like it probably fell off, right? We've got a corner chipped off here, the edge is chipped off. I'm not gonna lay this paver. As I'm doing quality control, as I'm laying pavers, I'm looking at it, if they have any weird surface cracks or a corner is chipped off because it fell off the pallet or got hit by the bobcat. Um, you know, as you're working through these projects, whoops, start to notice those little problems set that paper aside maybe you can use it later as a cut piece I need a uh, trowel I dropped one made a boo-boo all right so here we go we're just gonna fix that sand up a little bit now <clears throat> as we're working through this is anybody starting to see a pattern emerge I think actually sitting over here you probably have a better opportunity. Um, well actually the way that it runs is diagonal this way. As you look at it from different angles you'll notice that the pattern will emerge from different ways, right? Let's go ahead and just put a, uh, well let's, let's use a big one because we've gone big, medium, small. Let's put a big one in first. So the reason I'm trying to do this is I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep to the predetermined palletization of these pavers. I'm trying to make sure that I lay it in somewhat of a uniform layered fashion. And again, that means two squares and two littles to every single large one. One thing too, just with the with the slate stone, because the all the pieces are on one pallet, what we should do, obviously this is just a little test area, yeah. but if this is a big patio, we want to use multiple pallets at a time, right? Because go the one color more mix goes vertical from top to bottom as you start to go through the pallet. We can do obviously one more row. using multiple pallets. Um, helps you get a color mix, but also pulling so two squares uh, now. a couple layers 
at a time and then mixing it in helps you get a better blend. Always try to keep an eye out for maybe all of a sudden you've got a dark splotch or a light splotch throughout your patio. Obviously this is a blend so you're going to have some of both and to keep an even color is going to really make your patio turn out better over, over the course of the project. Yep, perfect. I think we'll call it good right there. So, um, you know, you see how fast and easy this goes. Once you've got your sand bedded, you know, we've already got this little four by seven or eight foot section laid out. It took us a total of about 10 minutes, right? These things lay in really nice and easy. Now, <clears throat> if I was doing this at a client's house, I might have a second string line somewhere to make sure that all my pavers are aligned. Does anybody else have a trick that they use in the field to make sure that their pavers are staying square as they're laying out their pattern. Anybody got any tricks? Use a square? <laughs> I don't know if that's a trick, I think that's just the way, right? Um, so, you know, one thing that I'm looking at is wherever I have four paver points intersecting, I wanna see a perfect cross, right? So if my cross is a little bit kittywampus and one side of it is off a little bit, then I'm gonna stop and diagnose why I have that, why I have that deviation. And we can just go ahead and keep laying this, this uh, pattern in here. Now if I was to fire up my laser transit again, and I was to set it up at the high point here in the corner, and then check down here, it should mirror what I saw with the pipes. We should have a half inch deviation, half inch of slope coming away from our bar here. And again, we're always pushing water away from the stuff that we, we're building, whether it's a hardscape feature, a home foundation, garage, whatever. We're always trying to push water away from that. So now what Joe's doing is exactly what we saw in the demonstration there, uh, the PowerPoint slides. He's taking his trowel, he's cleaning up the edges. Now, we don't need snap edge along this edge because we're gonna build a freestanding wall there. Yes, sir. So we would put a piece out here to secure the edge of the pavers out here by the outside edge of the bar. So we would use our snap edge there. There we go. And then we'd go through with our 10 or 12 inch spikes, pound those suckers into our base material, and then we know that we've, we've eliminated the ability for these pavers to slide side to side, right? Awesome. Yeah, we'll just pull it back a little bit farther. Perfect. And then what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start construction of a seat wall. How many of you guys are doing design work, design and sales for your company? We've got a few designers, a few sales guys. Um, you know, if you were here at the seminar yesterday, you know I'm all about the upsell. I'm all about the upsell. Always be looking for ways to make your project stand out a little bit whenever you're doing paver patio. I mean, what I tell my clients when I go out and meet with them is I'm gonna give you a Cadillac plan and then I'm gonna give you a corresponding line item quote. In other words, my paver installation is gonna be separated from say a seat wall or a pillar or a stair or a bar kit. I'm gonna give them separate numbers for each of those items. That way they can go through and prioritize what features are most important to them, right? The other thing it does for you is it gives you an ability to upsell. We can do more than flat patios. There's vertical features that we can inject into these designs that make things a lot more interesting. Helps your project stand out, look a little bit different from uh, you know XYZ landscaper down the road that's mowing lawns and putting in patios on the side. So now that we've got our sand cleaned up, again, we're making a couple of assumptions here. We're assuming that we have re-leveled our base. If you remember, when we set up a pitch, we set up a pitch, we only want that to affect the pavers. Just because our pavers are running a half inch low so that we can push water off them, doesn't mean we're gonna apply that same strategy to our seat wall or our bar or any other feature that we're gonna build. We want this to be level side to side. So it's a separate process. After you've laid your pavers in, you go back over this, take your six foot level or whatever, check your base material. If you have to repack some stuff in, you know, you got a half inch deviation, pack that material in now, and we're assuming that that's been done here. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to start with our, our ledge stone. We're going to build a pillar first. Or actually, why don't we build a seat wall first, huh? Right here. Um, what we're going to do, because we're going to build a pillar on the corner here, set that one in sideways. Yeah, there you go. So our ledge stone, Willow, Willow Creek ledge stone product, this is one of my favorite blocks. It's a four by eight by 12. I grew up building Legos. I was a Lego maniac. I have uh, three kids right now. My kids are nine, 10, and 11. We still have buckets of Legos from when I was a kid because I was a Lego maniac. But what I want to point out here is that this four by eight by 12 block can do so many different jobs, right? Just like the Versalock standard block, we can use this. We can stack it in what we call sort of a mosaic panel. We can stack it on a half running bond. There's all kinds of cool options. If you look at some of the pictures that we have and some of the brochures, there's all kinds of cool different ways that we can use this stone to create different aesthetics, different looks, right? It's literally one of those products that the only limit to what you can do with it is kind of your creativity. So I don't know if you can focus in on this, but as we build our pillar, we're creating, we're creating a bond here. We're not letting these vertical lines create zippers up our pillar, right? We're, ha we're chasing our tails around, creating bond. Each row of this is going to be glued. You can't pin these. Uh, you're going to use a block adhesive after each row that you're stacking uh, upwards to go ahead and, and secure those blocks in place. Now we'll go ahead and finish the wall out. We'll just go ahead and stack it back to roughly the end. And I think we've got a couple of cut pieces. So we're going to stack this wall on a half bond just for ease of installation. And again, upsell, upsell, upsell. We're doing what we call an accent row on our paver patio. Right? We've got um, slate stone blue for the body, and then we're using a cream border. So we call that an accent border. Now, we would probably mirror, were this an installation at a client's home, we would probably mirror this color in an accent row that's going to be in the seat wall and the pillar. So we're going to go ahead and do that today, but we're going to use a black paver just to show you the different contrasts you can create by switching up material colors. I think we've got one more half piece there. Why don't we go ahead and, yep, uh, no, let's go ahead and stack a few more rows on the pillar. Uh, don't do that. Do the seat wall first. Okay. Fair enough. Good point. All right. So we're going to get the seat wall stacked up here. One thing I want to point out is that, again, upsell opportunity. I saw a lot of guys raise their hands uh, when Greg asked about lighting, how many guys are doing lighting. Now, when you put an accent, like a paver row through a seat wall, it creates this really nice channel down the center that you can run wires through, right? So if you know that you're going to be doing a seat wall with an accent color on it, ask about lights. Maybe this is an opportunity to upsell some lights. Uh, you know, if you go back to this project and you take pictures at night, those lights really pop. It's super cool. I did a patio uh, right behind my house. It's actually, literally, I look out my back window, I can see it out my kitchen window. We put lights in there. Every time I look back there at night, I just smile a little bit. It looks really cool. Everything is popping, right? So take the opportunity to upsell this stuff. Let's leave the back open because we are going to actually run a light through here. Bert, yes. do you want to run a wire up underneath this column before we stack it any higher? We actually don't need to use any middle piece because we're going to end cap this with a pillar. So we don't need to have a paver that's going to come in here and break that gap. We can slide these down like this. And it's going to meet right up with the pillar that we're going to build. But you see what I mean here? This channel is a perfect opportunity to run a wire through there and install a light. There you go. Cool. So we're going to slide this stuff down, set in our accent row. Now, I want to point out that these pavers that we're using, 
these pavers are also permeable pavers, which means that there's a 3 8 inch gap. So we have a pretty thick chamfer on the side. Um, if you're doing this on site, glue is actually a big help to you, right? And you might put the glue just a little bit thicker on the outside. If you see here, this paver has the ability to wobble a little bit, right? We don't want that to wobble. What I've actually done in the past, if it gets real gnarly, is that I'll use a shim, a temporary shim, under the front side of this paver. Slip it in right here, and then once it's glued, it's going to stay in place better. So it's just a little trick you can use when you're doing these accents rows and trying to stack pavers because pavers are really manufactured to, to have a horizontal application, right? So we're cheating a little bit when we use a paver as an accent band through a wall. So there might be a couple of little things that you can do that are going to help these things stay a little bit more sturdy as you're stacking them up. Cool. So let's go ahead and um, stack one more row of ledge stone on top of this. Perfect. So you see what I mean here? As he's stacking that on there, he's got to be real careful because the bottoms of the pavers aren't glued yet. So he's just making sure that he doesn't knock a paver over when he's setting these, this next row up on top here. Nice. But you can already kind of see what's starting to happen here, right? I mean, that accent row pops at you. It's just an opportunity to set your portfolio apart, make your projects stand out a little bit compared to what some of the competition are doing. I know the reason that you guys got up this morning and made sure that you were here at 8 o'clock for this seminar is because you want to be better every year. You want to master your craft. You want to do the best job you can do for your clients, build your business, right? So as you're doing that, think about these little things. As you're, as you're getting through the design process, this is an easy upsell. I might only charge an extra 100 or $200 to do an accent row, but how much did it cost me? It's free Budweiser. I, it cost me nothing. All I had to do is order a different color block, right? Super easy way to upsell your projects, make them stand out. Think about those contrasting colors, mixing light with dark. Um, why don't we go ahead and, yeah, we'll go ahead and slap the caps on there. This is a new Willow product this year. Um, Willow Creek has made coping stones in the past. They were nice. They got the job done. This year, the egg mix on these is amazing. Um, to be honest with you, when I first looked at these capstones and I walked in here, I thought that they were actually just split bluestone because it looks so much like New York bluestone. Really nice finished look now to the seat wall, right? This is, um, this is what I would consider an, an upsold wall. I've kind of put all the different little tricks in my tool bag, thrown them all at this. We have a nice natural stone look to the coping, our accent block. This is a structural seat wall. Seat walls are typically only going to be up to about 24 inches. I do 18 on mine. Anybody do anything different for seat walls? Not unless you're working at an NBA player's house or something like that, right? Typically 18 to 24 inches on a seat wall. Now, we're trying to create a little bit of vertical transition between the seat wall and the pillar. So again, just like we use a contrasting accent row in the seat wall, the pillar is going to stick up a little bit higher. So if we're building an 18 uh, to 20 inch seat wall, we're probably going to look at building our pillar up around that 30 inch benchmark, right? So that we get a little bit of height variation there. So let's go ahead and stack this up quick. Did you want to put a light on the pillar? We better feed that through right now. So again, we're trying not to paint ourselves into a corner here, right? We could probably just feed it right through this backside. Now, has anybody got anything that they do? We just want to make sure that this wire can come up through the center here. Anybody got a good way of getting electrical wiring through their pillar up to the light? Anybody got any tricks they use? So what do you do for getting the wire under the pillar? You just run it? You just run it bareback underneath the pillar? Well, I'll tell you what I do, is I build it in as an option on my pillars that we'll go ahead and run PVC electrical conduit 
underneath the base for the pillar when we're constructing it, when we're building it. That way that, that PVC conduit is built in already. So if they hire somebody to add lights later, all they have to do is feed that, that wire through that PVC pipe, right? And it'll pop up through the middle of our conduit and then you can power a, a low voltage light that way. I thought we wanted that light up a little bit closer, like under the, I think we we're gonna put it right over the accent if we can. I just want to point out, again, we're, we're just stacking this in a typical running bond fashion, but you can use uh, these, these ledge stone pavers to create more of like a mosaic pattern, right? You can stack them vertically. You can stack them so that the short side shows here like this. There's actually one, two, three different ways that you can stack these things and show the two different faces, right? Yeah, we'll go maybe one row higher and then we'll add our accent in. Oh, perfect. So we have all these cut. Here, I'll take a couple. Now where I on the site right now and my new guy, uh, you know, Joe, he's, he's a sales guy, he doesn't know how to install, right? So as Joe's sitting here stacking this thing, I'd be looking at this right now and these little corners would bother me, right? I would probably take a level and I'd run it vertical up the side of the wall to make sure that we have a sheer face, right? So it's not, it's not mixed up. But for the case, case uh, purpose of demonstration here, we're assuming that this pillar is stacked up perfectly. So what we've done here, I just want to point out the accent row on the pillar. We've gone ahead and mitered in this cut right here. And that's just so that the corners are gonna meet up and touch flush. We don't always have to miter this, these blocks in. There are different ways to do this. But none look quite as good as mitering in these corners. It's kind of nice that we're running the light over the top of these pavers because this chamfer kind of creates a natural channel for the wire. A lot of times you have to go up with your, with your brick saw or whatever and cut a little channel in the wire. I just want to point out that to run these lights, we haven't had to modify our block at all. Our accents have actually helped us out in that it's allowed us to run these, whoops, run these wires without having to go ahead and modify our block. Oops, sorry, I'll sneak back this way too. So, boom, now we can see it. Typically you'd have a couple guys, you know, over here. You guys use your finger wedges to check to see if your tops are even, right? If you can get under the second knuckle there, that's about right. So, you know, I would be saying, you know, let's move this a little bit this way and dial it in just right to get that thing centered on there. But I think you get the idea. This has a really nice aesthetic. Didn't take long. How long have we been here? Like a half an hour? You know, maybe 40 minutes. We've got this section of patio laid in. We built a freestanding wall and a pillar. Once your base work is done, it's just that easy. And that's why these upsell opportunities, this pillar, um, you know, I don't like to get too involved in pricing, but we're probably going to charge five, maybe $600 for this thing, right? Price keeps going up because the, you know, the job that we do keeps on getting better, right? We're able to deliver a superior product to what we were doing five years ago, so we're gonna maybe charge a little bit more for it. I used to do pillars for closer to 400, now we're five to 600 on a pillar like this with an accent row and conduit run up underneath it. Seat walls, same thing. I might be charging 50 bucks a square foot to install a seat wall like this. The hard work is done, especially if I'm doing a patio. The base is already done, 90%. You have to tune it in, dial it up a little bit, but for the most part, this is an upsell opportunity that's all profit. It's all money in your pocket at the end of the day, and that's why I learned, even if people call me out and they say, we just want a flat patio, I'm gonna say, that's fine, I'll bid a flat patio for you, but I'm gonna throw some different ideas at you. Are you open to ideas? How many people say no? <laughs> you ask if people are open to ideas, almost nobody says no. That's a hard yes every time. Yeah, we're open to ideas, of course we are, right? Who shuts the door on that? So it's an easy way to upsell different features, whether it's a, a column or a seat wall or a bar, 
pizza oven, all this cool stuff that we have the tools to do now. Um, you know, reach deep and, and find a way to sell this stuff. Because as you're working on your websites and your Facebook pages and your Instagrams and your Pinterest, which we do all those, by the way, we're on, we're on a lot of different social media platforms, but as you're doing this, it helps your project stand apart, right? I've actually had clients, um, one of my projects is on the cover of the Versalock brochure, and I had a guy call in last year, and he wanted to know who put that project in. Well, I landed a big job off of that, because he wanted the guy that did that job, right? So as you're doing these, these projects, think about that. If the right person sees that picture, they're gonna wanna know who did it, and they're gonna want you, right? So make yourself more valuable to your clients and more profitable to your business by doing things a little bit different than a lot of people do them. Think about new ways to upsell and pad your portfolio with some cool features like accent rows, lights, vertical features, stuff like that. Are there any questions on anything we've seen?